morning and welcome. It's that time once again, rocking and firing on a Monday, the Patriot Radio News Hour. I'm Joe Jaquin, CEO of the Patriot Trading Group, and our toll free number 800 951 Wealth Insurance, the physical delivery of gold and silver. It is what we do. The website, the without a doubt, the most educational website on the planet when it comes to hard assets, allamericangold.com, because it's not just who you know, it's what you know, and that's where you get it all, the videos, the articles, the podcast, the YouTube, Facebook, what else, what am I missing, Twitter, I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to do it all at allamericangold.com and what a what a man someone needs to turn the heat off it got hot again this week and i saw i was reading the paper and uh, two more people got plucked off a camelback mountain this week and listen you cannot go hiking mountains without water then if you're not feeling good don't go <laughs> it's dangerous out there uh never ceases to amaze me how how often that happens out here but uh yeah it's still in the mid to upper 90s, uh, crazy. Hopefully, though, hopefully, sooner or later, the cool air will come, and then we can brag about how wonderful it is. I have yet to go to either of my son's football games in anything other than shorts and a short sleeve shirt. I haven't had to even pretend, because, you know, listen, we pretend it's cold. Anything remotely like in the 80s, low 80s, definitely in the 70s. We're going to have a long sleeve shirt on, pants. Yeah, no, haven't had to do it yet. Uh, don't know if I was going to be able to do it this weekend or not either. But uh, we'll hope for the cool down to take effect sooner or later. I did hear this morning, I don't know, I haven't confirmed, but I did hear that they may finally have some of those fires under control in California. Incredible. What it's, it's it's gotten crazy. I saw an article. I don't know. Did you see this article about the Yellowstone super volcano uh, may erupt a lot sooner than anybody thought. <laughs> Man, just throw that onto the list of things to worry about. We we'll get you all covered. I got another update on the deficit. Some people are starting to take notice and putting into, uh, I guess. Uh, into detail just how big the problem really is and we're talking about you know here's what's so funny and we're talking about tax cuts and 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 i'm all for less tax i want to see tax cuts but at the same time you can't cut taxes if you don't cut the spending (laughs) because it just doesn't work that way and especially when wall streets are at all-time highs do corporations need a tax cut i'm just saying i don't know uh, but neither here nor there. I know it's got, they got me sounding like a liberal. This is how messed up it really is out there. Of course, I, how did we get this big? How did they get to, to be such a problem? But now uh, more people are starting to do some, what I, what I call basic math. You know, when you take away all the zeros, it, it really comes down to, to math that you learned in second, third, fourth, fifth grade. Uh, we're going to update you on that, uh, how much it's going to cost us uh, to get it back under control, and then uh, update you on the banks. The banks are releasing earnings. Uh, Citigroup today just got bashed over the head. Uh, loan loss provision. Now, this is the way the banks have been pretending to make money, by saying that, that they didn't have a lot of bad loans and they were taking this money that they had set aside for previous bad debts and added it back in well apparently it's going back out again uh 15 percent higher the loan loss provisions from citigroup think about that in one year 15 percent increase in loan loss provisions uh, just on Citigroup alone. So remember, we had Dick Beauvais. He was on uh, the Idiot Box last week. We played him here talking about how the bank earnings, when you when you get rid of all the BS, 
The banks are generating less revenue today than they were 10 years ago, and it's not getting any better. The problem is they've got a lot more debt than they did 10 years ago. Uh, going to give you an update on student loan debt. You know, when you think about it, you know, you have the mortgage debt. The next biggest debt we have our consumer or is uh, college loan. I mean, that's second. And then it's automobiles, and then it's credit cards. Uh, we're going to update you today on that. And then I don't know if you saw uh, the Japanese steelmaker Kobe. And I thought it was a – they were falsifying uh, records, like, on their accounting. <laughs> right? Hey, by the way, you know what? We lied. We really didn't make this. It's the third largest steelmaker. Uh, I don't know if it's in the world or in Japan. They're a big one. But they actually – they didn't fake the data about sales. Apparently, they faked the data about the quality of their steel. And this is steel that, you know, we use in cars and, you know, nuclear power plants. Uh, I'm going to guess airplanes. Yeah, airplanes. And apparently, it's not up to snuff, or at least it's not as uh, a good a product as they claim to be. Uh, just just incredible. They will lie about anything, won't they? So they are one, two, three. Yeah, so Kobe steals customers. Mitsubishi, Toyota, or Toyota, I'm not sure if I say that right. Everyone says I don't. General Motors, Ford, Nissan, and Honda. Yeah, so pretty much everybody. Apparently, the steel used in those cars uh, isn't as good as they claimed it to be. Patriot Radio News Hour. We're going to talk about debt next. Eight hundred nine five one zero five nine two. That is the toll free number. I'm super super excited. Wendy uh, was on the phone right as I was uh, coming up to the break, and and we have an opportunity on my favorite coin, and I always get excited because they're awesome. Best coin ever minted talking about the US five dollar liberty or five dollar liberty five dollar Indian. That is the male Indian with the the war headdress on. Uh, Bella Pratt was the artist. Uh, this was again this was in the ending of the Liberty series. Remember Teddy Roosevelt was president and not that uh, the the Lady Liberty wasn't an attractive woman. You know, it's just the side profile of her face. But Teddy didn't think the Liberties were, were majestic enough for a country as great as the United States. And so he commissioned Augustus St. Gaudens, right? Okay, so he did the $20 St. He also did the $10 female Indian. And and Bella Pratt, who did the $5 and $2.5 Indians. Matter of fact, it is the only coin, and I want to say till this day, the only coin with an incused design. And simply what that means is they carved into the coin. In other words, there's grooves in the coin itself, which had never been done, and as far as I know, has never been duplicated. Uh, one of the things that makes the Indians unique is, so they were the kind of the fractional coin to go along with the Saints, right? So they had the $20 Saint. There was no 10 or 5 or $2.5 Saint Gaudens. Those were the Indians. And like I said, the the $10 Indian, that was Lady Liberty with an uh, an Indian headdress on. But this $5 Indian, that was, you know, the portrait of an American Indian in full war headdress uh, with that accused design. And then remember the plague, the the plague of the mid to late uh, 19th, 16, 
17, 18, 19, 100. And a lot of people thought, because of this accused design, that the plague was within the coin, that it, these coins were carrying the plague. So they actually went a bunch of years without even minting any more of them. And, 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 and as my uncle says, that's where the, uh, don't put that in your mouth, you don't know where it's been, comes from. Now, I don't know if that part is true, but that's what he says, and I'll go with it. Uh, these are the $5 male Indians. These are the XFs. This is one grade below an AU coin, or an almost uncirculated coin. These are what they call extra fine. These are really, really nice coins. What is real? A beautiful coin. Here's the thing that it makes it even more awesome. We have like a hundred of them, which never happens, especially on the internet. They're just still, even today, super hard to get. The the raw the the raw ones, the ones that we normally sell, they're four hundred and ten dollars. You're going to be able to go all the way up to almost uncirculated, just one grade below that, for the exact same price of four ten. So U.S. five dollar. XF. These are extra fine. These things are going to be awesome. Four hundred and ten bucks at eight hundred nine five one zero five nine two. If you buy twenty or more, I'm going to throw in the shipping as well. Eight hundred nine five one zero five nine two. If you want to put it on a credit card, you're going to have to add five bucks. So five bucks more, still at four fifteen, an absolute steal at eight hundred nine five one zero five nine two. What are we getting ready for? Right? Why are we telling you you need to be prepared? So I've been telling you about the the debts and how they're mounting up, right? And we're we're just now getting in to the super cycle. So. John Malden, who by the site that I love to go to, uh, Malden Economics, if you haven't been out there, he does great research. So he talks about how, and we hear this quite a bit, the CBO says, hey, in 10 years, the debt is going to be $30 trillion. And of course, I laugh and I tell you, you know, it's the government don't believe that it's going to be much, much worse. Well, Molden actually dove into the CBO's projection. And here's the assumption, just to have a debt to only be $30 trillion. And then we say only. It's a, I mean, it's almost laughable. Their assumption assumes that there's no recession. Again, so we're going to go now, according to the CBO, we're going to go 20 straight years without a recession. But they say that the growth rate, you know, the GDP, of 4%. Okay, we're at 2 right now. So when you look at what they predict, and this is why I've been saying, in 2027, the deficit's going to be $40 trillion. Right? That's my number. So John Malden comes out and says, here's where he's at. He would say, he would take a bet that the deficit in 2027 will be over $35 trillion. So now we've got somebody who's, let's face it, he's smarter than me, done a lot more research than I have, saying, I know Double said 40, but I'll bet it's going to be over 35. So uh, 40 is over that. So we're, we're honing in. And the, and the thing about it is, is when you hear these things, why would they lie? To what benefit is it? Right? They come out and say that we're going to have GDP of 4%. We haven't had GDP of 4% this millennium. Because this is what happens when you start piling on the debt. Right? It weighs you down. Look at Just think about it this way. Think about it in your own household. 
right? If you got a car and a house and, and a credit card and a student loan debt, right, and you're paying all these debts. And then all of a sudden, right, the credit card debt keeps piling up and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And the next thing you know, you have less money, right? You're, you're mailing out the checks to this, that, 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 this, this, and less money. you got less growth. Your household can't grow. And now, according to the CBO, they're lying about how bad the problem is really going to be. And the only question I have to ask is why? Why would they want to come out and misrepresent how bad it is? And the answer really is simple. Because if you came out and said the truth, <laughs> could you really you do tax cuts? If you came out and said the truth, could you really pretend like they do now about how they're not going to do anything to Social Security, and they're not going to do anything to Medicare, and it's going to be wonderful. Right? Could stocks really be at all-time highs if, if the deficit was going to be 35 or $40 trillion inside the next – think about what that means. That's not a trillion dollars a year. That's one point five to two trillion dollars a year and you know that by the end of it that number is going to be even bigger than that right because we'll, we'll start out gradual right like this last year yeah, there was a trillion right by 2020 maybe it's 1.3 trillion 1.4 trillion who knows maybe even 1.5 right by 2023 maybe it's two trillion Right by 2025, it's probably close to two and a half. By 2027, it's probably going to be close to three. So, what would it take? Let's just play a game. What would it take to actually live within our means? How big has the government really gotten? Because it's really hard. To, to, to put it in perspective, because you're talking about numbers that are so massive. Most people just tune it out. Right? You tune it out, I tune it out, and we all want to pretend, right? We When you listen to the idiot box, you notice how they never talk about it. Right? Nobody wants to bring it up. Right? They all want to argue about whether the rich guy is going to get a tax cut or not. But nobody actually wants to talk about what the real issues are. When Janet Yellen talks, she keeps talking about how eventually there's going to be some kind of wage inflation. When when you really look at it, the only inflation there really is is the inflation where all of us have less. Right? That stagflation. I don't know if you saw, by the way, crude oil back over 52 bucks. Right? Another one of those things. Hey, if you pay more for gas, is that really good for the economy? Probably not. But don't tell anybody. So how much would it take? Well, we actually had a guy, Larry uh, Koltikoff is his name. He wrote an article in Forbes. You know, that you know that right-wing wacko magazine, Forbes that we would need to immediately, now we're talking about tax cuts, and like I said, I've turned into a liberal on this. We would need an immediately a 50% increase in taxes to fund the future deficit. And this is the problem. Remember last week, I told you 10,000 people a day seven days a week, retire. And it's actually a little over that right now. And it's going to continue that way for the next 12 years without exception. And then you start thinking about what that really means. Now, if they charged 50% more in taxes. What, what, what would happen to GDP, right? It, it would crater, right? And we're in this horrible situation where we've got these, these unfunded liabilities that are now coming due. 
At the same time, the consumer is in the most indebted state that it's ever been in. And then you try to figure out how this is all going to work out. And then I, you know, the next thing that came up was Bloomberg's writing about the latest people falling behind now. So here we sit, we've got deficit rising, right? and this is national city, state, right? All the pension plans, all of these things that are underfunded. We have the U.S. consumer delinquencies are piling up. Citigroup today increased their loan loss reserves 15% increase just today from a year ago. Well, they have they've been doing it, right? So now their loan loss provisions have grown 15% in a single year. And then Bloomberg wrote this article talking about more student debtors are falling behind on their federal student loans. And they're not sure why. And the article goes, hey, after three years of declines in late payments, there's no clear explanation as to what's happening. I'm going to explain it all to you next. Don't forget U.S. $5 XF Indians at 410-800-951-0592. This is the Phyllis Schlafly Report, a daily broadcast from Phyllis Schlafly Eagles. And we're upholding the legacy of Phyllis Schlafly, a constitutional attorney and articulate voice for traditional values for more than 70 years. Now, from the Phyllis Schlafly Center Studios, here's Ryan Haidt. The Gulf War marked a new day for the American Armed Forces. Phyllis Schlafly considered this chapter of American military history to be especially important because it allowed the American people to shake off our self-image as a defeated nation, characterized by that embarrassing picture of the helicopter lifting its last load of refugees out of Saigon. The Gulf War allowed the American people to compare and contrast the Vietnam War under President Lyndon B. Johnson and the Gulf War under President George H.W. Bush. Just weeks ago, we saw a similar contrast as President Trump announced a change from President Obama's policy in Afghanistan. The Gulf War proved the duty of a nation to remain constantly ready to defend its interests in the face of military opposition. Every other function, from the preservation of free speech to the preservation of national parks, is predicated on the ability of the nation to defend itself in military combat. President Trump has made great strides in reshaping America's military to be able to fulfill that fundamental task of defending America. With new policies barring transgender individuals from military service, the president has reaffirmed his commitment to taking the focus of the military off of political correctness and putting it back on winning in combat. Our military now has a commander-in-chief who recognizes what their proper function is. By allowing our troops to do their job and equipping them for it, the president is showing that he understands history and has the best interests of our troops and our nation in mind. Phyllis Schlafly wrote about the Gulf War because she understood that our history can give us lessons of lasting value. The biggest lesson to learn from the Gulf War is that total military superiority is the best way to protect our nation. The April 1991 Phyllis Schlafly report verifies the fact that President Trump's Afghanistan strategy will save American lives and lead to a more swift conclusion that neither President Obama nor President Johnson in Vietnam could have achieved. This has been the Phyllis Schlafly Report from Phyllis Schlafly Eagles. America is safe only when America is strong. Our national defense requires the most modern technology and best trained soldiers, and there should be no social politics or idle threats coming out of Washington. At phyllisschlafly.com, we take this work very seriously. Please visit phyllisschlafly.com. Thanks for listening, and join us again for the Phyllis Schlafly Report. Eight hundred nine five one zero five nine two. That is our toll free number. And Bloomberg writes this article, and they're talking about how student loan. And 
I won't call I won't use the word default. You're just falling behind. And they said, but you know, for three years it got better. And now it's now it's gotten worse and there's no clear explanation according to the article. Experts they're not sure whether to take it as a sign of distress or a temporary blip. <laughs> okay, let's see. I'm not making that payment this month. What could oh, I just don't feel like maybe they just didn't feel like it. That's what it is. You know, they didn't ah, I don't feel like doing it. Of course it's a sign of distress. But what about this after three years of decline? Student loan debt, it, the, at least people falling behind got better, but did it? We're going to get to that in a second. The, the share of Americans that are at least 31 days late. Now, these do not include the deferments. And this is another thing they don't really want you to know, right? Because right now, millions of Americans are on deferment. Hey, I... I I'm struggling right now. Can you give me a year or two before I have to start paying type thing? But they're late at least 31 days on their loans from the Department of Education. And now, this is amazing, right? 18.8%. Okay, so 19% of everybody with a student loan is now 31 days late or more. Again, that doesn't count that when you get to the people on deferment, now the number is approaching 40%, right? It's staggering. But again, why tell the truth when, when a lie sounds so much better? Of course, this is the latest coming out of the data from the government, about 3.3 million Americans have gone at least a month without making a payment. That shot up by 320,000 borrowers. Another a big 10% increase. The rise interrupts a period of 12 straight quarters where the de delinquency rate declined. Now that actually sounds pretty good until you understand why it declined and why this number is really even worse. And they go on to say, but the economy's improved, which normally would mean borrowers would be more able to pay off their debt. So again, I guess this is where the mystery comes in, right? So why is it happening? If, if the data, if the economics are better, the economy is better, the job situation is better, of course, it really isn't. Right? I spend a lot of my time being frustrated by the fact, you know, we've got less people, new new uh, job openings this year than we did last year and all that other stuff. But why did it decrease to begin with? The surprise for what it, why it happened three years ago was that President Obama, they made it easier for people to pay. In other words, people did not have to make the minimum payment any longer. And this helped borrowers who couldn't afford the monthly payment to make some kind of payment. So we were so desperate, we said, forget the, you know, the minimum payment, 300 bucks. Well, how can you have that? They were going for a zero default rate. That was their goal. Now remember, right, right now it's at 19%, not including the deferment. Even, and they said, those with income-based repayment plans. In other words, if you weren't making a lot of money, they lowered the, the they didn't care if you were sending in 50 bucks. Even debtors with no income could remain in good standings on their loans as long as they annually documented that they had no earnings. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
So despite that, three years later, even with all of these things that came into effect, the default rate is rising again. They said 4.8 million uh, debtors are taking advantage of this plan. By the way, that's up from 4.2 million. So let's see, we've had 600,000 people legally not make payments. An increase of 600,000 people not making payments, but they weren't on the total of the 320. So really, when you look at the numbers, the amount of people not making a monthly payment to their student loan jumped by a million people. 600 and over 600,000 of you are doing it legally. Hey, listen, I'm broke enough. Right? Part of the, the this new policy, I guess the other 300-some thousand, you're actually making some money, but... You're, you got to pay your car insurance, your health insurance. You got to pay the rent. And when you're all said and done, there's not enough to make out. The delinquency rate is now starting to cause distress amongst people who who track such things and saying that a growing number of Americans now are getting ready to go into default on their student loan. Now, I only bring this up because unlike the government, we don't have a printing press, right? The citizenry doesn't have one. So as the government goes further and further and further into debt, it not it ironic that Americans are going further and further into debt? By the way, just to put a number on it, 42 million Americans now have some form of student debt. That's the latest number, at least as far as the government's producing. I'll see if I can find a better number. Uh, but as of 2014, so that number is old. So let's just probably say it's probably close to 50 million people with a student loan debt. And now you start thinking about these are the people that are supposed to be buying houses and cars, right? Supposed to be out there spending. And now, you know, this is what I've said. They've got to us earlier and earlier. First thing that happens when you walk on a campus at college is what? Everybody's out there trying to hand you a credit card. Patriot Radio News Hour. We'll be back after the break. 800 951 Gold is up a couple of more bucks today, 1304 Silver is higher as well. Silver now $17.43. As again, now we're focused back on what is real. And when you focus on what is real, that's when gold always does the best. Right? Then you get into the, oh, let's talk about economic theory and surveys and all that other mumbo-jumbo. And when uh, the, any of these Fed meetings come around, they like to pretend. I was I, I actually looked it up. So today we're, we're running the $5 Indian. Uh, the Bella Pratt design, the NQ's design, and it's got the the male Indian and the I mean the full headset on, and the backside's got the American Eagle on its perch. And remember, I told you this was the one that had the NQ's design, and they thought that it carried the play. So it was minted in starting in 1908, and they minted it every year. And through 1916. And then they stopped. And they didn't mint the $5 Indian again except for one year, which was 1929. And that was the last year that they minted the Indian. Only one year, which was the year 1909 mintage, did they mint more than 3 million of them. The 
next highest mint year was 1911, when they minted just about 1.5 million. And then no other year after that did they mint, in any mint mark, did they mint a million coins. Matter of fact, some of the 148,000, 34,000, 297,000, even 1929, they only minted 662,000. 1916, they only minted 240,000. So there wasn't very many of these made. And you think about one of the most beautiful coins ever. And then when you look at even like the, the, the $10 Indian, now, the $10 Indian, they didn't have that in Q's design. And so that coin they minted again. It was minted all the way through 1916. And then they minted again in 1920, 1926, 1930, 1932, 1933. So the $5 Indian was minted for far fewer years than any other of its counterparts. And it was minted in quantities much less than the rest. So when you look at the $5 Indian market, not only is it the best-looking coin, it's the rarest. There's the least of them. They hold their values well above what any of the other coins will do. I mean, outside of the, the year of the 1933 St. Gaudens, Right, the year of gold confiscation. Remember, there's only supposed to be two of them in existence. And then I think, what was it, five, six years ago, they found nine more. And there's a big debate about whether or not uh, who's going to own them and whatnot. The $5 Indians are the rarest of the rare. And to be able to get all the way up to one grade below AU, the extra fine at Four hundred and ten dollars. I will tell you. I know for a fact. This is the lowest premiums you're going to pay on an XF graded five dollar Indian at four hundred and ten dollars. Our toll free number eight hundred nine five one zero five nine two. You know, it's always good. I'm glad I actually looked it up. I knew they stopped bending them. I didn't know they only minted them one other year. So you had 1908, 09, 1910, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, where they hardly minted any, any of them. And then 1929, that's it for the $5 Indians. And to have this many of them, to have almost 100 of them, is unheard of. 800 951 Zero five nine two. That is our toll free number. If you've never done business with us, it is so simple, so easy. All you need to do is call the eight hundred number, and then when Wendy answers, just tell her, Wendy, I'd like the special. And Wendy's going to say, Great. How many would you like? One, five. You want free shipping? You buy twenty of them. And then she's going to take your name your address, because we need a place to ship it. And once we have good funds, we ship registered, insured U.S. mail. When you place your order, we're going to give you a trade number. That trade number locks in the price. Gold goes up $20 tomorrow. We're not going to call you and say, hey, you owe us more money. We're locked in. You mail us a check. Like I said, if you want to put it on a credit card, add $5 a coin. We take Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and Discover, right? all four big ones. Once we have good funds, we ship it to you, registered, insured, U.S. mail. It's that simple. We're not going to try to convince you not to buy them and try to sell you some other coin with super high markets. We don't do that. We don't play games. And, and not that we don't want to talk to you. We do. But we try not to keep you out, you know, on the phone, ad infinitum. It's just that simple. And once it's done, once you've placed your order, you've gotten your trade number, and you've hung up the phone, you're not going to hear from us. We don't call you. We're not going to call you three weeks from now, a month from now, two months from now, to try to get you to buy something else. 
It's the exact opposite way of how you run a business, but that's how we've been doing it. We've been doing it this way for well over 20 years. The U.S. $5 Indian, XF grade 410 at 800-951-0592. Final segment coming up. Boy, this is out of UBS. They're talking about an unlimited number of disconnects in the financial markets. Not the least, which is the shocking divergence in recent years between the ever-plunging unemployment rate in the United States and the stubbornly rising delinquencies on consumer debt. <laughs> it's exactly what we've been talking about. And they, they talk about the 90-day delinquency rate on consumer loans was up another 20 basis points, led by deteriorations in auto loans. And they said the trend in recent loan vintages, that means you know auto loans that have been taken out in the last year, showing a negative outlook on balance. In other words, more trouble ahead. They said the the incremental deterioration is shifting from auto loans to credit cards and student loans. So now right, the only thing left is mortgages, and I'm telling you those are starting to percolate as well. Auto and credit card loan default rates uh, by credit quality, continue to show sequential deterioration on average. In other words, it doesn't matter. Prime, subprime, super subprime, the default rates are continuing to rise. And they said multiple interest rate hikes by the Federal Reserve has increased, you know, what you got to pay for student loans, car loans, credit card balances, all of it leading up to more and more defaults. And one of the things they noted in this note was the lack of pay. They said the number one reason that they see the increase in the loans, or the defaults in the loans, is the lack of pay. So contrary to the Federal Reserve, well, I guess not kind of right. They, the Federal Reserve can't understand why no one's making any money. Uh, UBS came out today and says, hey, whether or not making money, not making money, either way, defaults continue to spiral. And, and you just really start to get ready. This is going to be, this isn't going to be a, a quarter trend or a one-year trend. This is going to be 10 years of this. The super cycle is here. The debts are here. The money is due, and America's tapped out. You better have some wealth insurance because, you, you know, we're going to need it. I mean, just look at the numbers. I mean, now Malden comes out and says, listen, just I'm taking bets right now at over $35 trillion. Right? And I've been telling you $40 trillion now for how long? It's coming. The U.S. Five dollar liberties. These the rarest of the the best looking, and you know, just by the by the the rarest coin. The U.S. five dollar male Indian. These are XF, just super awesome. They're four hundred and ten dollars. If you want to put it on your credit card, I get you right. Hey, you want your points? You want your miles? You want whatever it is? Add five dollars a coin if you buy twenty or more. We're going to throw in the shipping at 800-951-0592. Patriot Radio News Hour. Everyone take care. Have a great rest of your Monday. We'll have more talk about economics tomorrow.